When we ended last time, we were considering arguments for and against affirmative action, counting race as a factor in admissions. And in the course of the discussion, three arguments emerged, three arguments for affirmative action. One of them was the idea that race and ethnic background should count as a way of correcting for the true meaning of test scores and grades, getting a more accurate measure of the academic potential those scores, those numbers represent. Second was what we called the compensatory argument, the idea of righting past wrongs, past injustice. And the third was the diversity argument. And when Cheryl Hopwood in the 1990s challenged the University of Texas Law School's affirmative action program in the federal courts, the University of Texas made another version of the diversity argument, saying that the broader social purpose, the social mission of the University of Texas Law School is to produce leaders in the legal community, in the political community, among judges, lawyers, legislators, and therefore it's important that we produce leaders who reflect the background and the experience and the ethnic and the racial composition of the state of Texas. It's important for our serving our wider social mission. That was the University of Texas Law School's argument. And then we considered an objection to the diversity argument, which after all is an argument in the name of the social mission, the common good. We saw that Rawls does not simply believe that arguments of the common good or the general welfare should prevail if individual rights must be violated in the course of promoting the common good. You remember that was the question, the challenge to the diversity rationale that we were considering when we finished last time. And we began to discuss the question, well, what right might be at stake? Maybe the right to be considered according to factors within one's control. Maybe this is the argument that Cheryl Hopwood implicitly was making. She can't help the fact that she's white. Why should her chance at getting into law school depend on a factor she can't control? And then Hannah, who was advancing an argument last time, said Harvard has the right to define its mission any way it wants to. It's a private institution. And it's only once Harvard defines its mission that we can identify the qualities that count. So no rights are being violated. Now, what about that argument? What I would like to do is to hear objections to that reply and then see whether others have an answer. Yes. And tell us your name. Da. Da. Right. You spoke up last time. All right. How do you answer that argument? Well, I think there was two things in there. One of them was that a private institution could define its mission however it wants. But then that doesn't make however it defines it right. Like, I could define my personal mission as I want to collect all the money in the world. But does that make it even a good mission? So you can't, like, you can't say that just because a uh, college is a private institution, it could just define it whatever it wants. It's, we still have to think about whether the way it's defining it is right. And in the case of affirmative action, a lot of people have said that since there's a lot of other factors involved, we could, why not race? Like, if we already know that the system is right, let's, let's. I want to stick with your first point, okay. Da. Here's Da's objection. Can a college or university define its social purpose any way it wants to, and then define admissions criteria accordingly? 
What about the University of Texas Law School, not today, but in the 1950s? Then there was another Supreme Court case against the admissions policy of the University of Texas Law School because it was segregated. It only admitted whites. And when the case went to court back in the 50s, the University of Texas Law School also invoked its mission. Our mission as a law school is to educate lawyers for the Texas bar, for Texas law firms. And no Texas law firm hires African Americans. So to fulfill our mission, we only admit whites. Or consider Harvard in the 1930s when it had anti-Jewish quotas. President Lowell, president of Harvard in the 1930s said that he had nothing personally against Jews, but he invoked the mission, the social purpose of Harvard, he said, which is not only to train intellectuals, Part of the mission of Harvard, he said, is to train stockbrokers for Wall Street, presidents and senators. And there are very few Jews who go into those professions. Now, here's the challenge. Is there a principal distinction between the invocation of the social purpose of the college or university today in the diversity rationale and the invocation of the social purpose or mission of the university by Texas in the 1950s or Harvard in the 1930s? Is there a difference in principle? What's the reply? Hannah? Well, I think that the principle that's different here is um, basically the distinction between inclusion versus exclusion. I think that it's morally wrong of the university to say, we're going to exclude you on the basis of your religion or your race. That's denial on the basis of arbitrary factors. What Harvard is trying to do today with its diversity initiatives is to include groups that were excluded in the past. Good. Let's see if, stay there. Let's see if someone would like to reply. Go ahead. As actually, this was kind of in support of Hannah. Um, rather than a reply, but right. I was going to say another principal difference can be based on malice being the just or the motivation, I guess, for the historical right. segregation act. So it's saying that we're not going to let blacks or Jews in because they're worse as pe people or as a group. Good. So the element of malice isn't present. And what's your name? Stevie. Stevie says that in the. Uh, in the historic segregationist, racist, anti-Semitic quotas or prohibitions, there was built into them a certain kind of malice, a certain kind of judgment that African Americans or Jews were somehow less worthy than everybody else. Whereas present day affirmative action programs don't involve or imply any such judgment. What it amounts to saying is, so long as a policy just uses people, in a way, as valuable to the social purpose of the institution, it's OK, provided it doesn't judge them maliciously, as Stevie might add, as intrinsically less worthy. I'd like to raise a question. Doesn't that concede that all of us, when we compete for positions or for seats in colleges and universities, in a way are being used, not judged, but used in a way that has nothing to do with moral desert? Remember, we got into this whole discussion of affirmative action when we were trying to figure out whether distributive justice should be tied to moral desert or not. And we were launched on that question 
by Rawls and his denial, his rejection of the idea, the distributive justice, whether it's positions or places in the class or income and wealth, is a, is a matter of moral desert. Suppose that were the moral basis of Harvard's admissions policy. What letters would they have to write to people they rejected or accepted for that matter? Wouldn't they have to write something like this? Dear unsuccessful applicant, we regret to inform you that your application for admission has been rejected. It's not your fault that when you came along, society happened not to need the qualities you had to offer. <laughs> Those admitted instead of you were not themselves deserving of a place, nor worthy of praise for the factors that led to their admission. We are in any case only using them and you as instruments of a wider social purpose. <laughs> Better luck next time. <laughs> what was the letter you actually got when you were admitted? Perhaps it should have read something like this. Dear successful applicant, we are pleased to inform you that your application for admission has been accepted. It turns out, lucky for you, that you have the traits that society needs at the moment, so we propose to exploit your assets for society's advantage. <laughs> you are to be congratulated, not in the sense that you deserve credit for having the qualities that led to your admission, but only in the sense that the winner of a lottery is to be congratulated, and if you choose to accept our offer, you will ultimately be entitled to the benefits that attach to being used in this way. We look forward to seeing you in the fall. <laughs> now, there is something a little odd, morally odd, if it's true that those letters do reflect the theory, the philosophy underlying the policy. So here's the question they pose. And it's a question that takes us back to a big issue in in political philosophy. Is it possible and is it desirable to detach questions of distributive justice from questions of moral desert and questions of virtue? In many ways, this is an issue that separates modern political philosophy from ancient political thought. What's at stake in the question of whether we can put desert, moral desert aside? It seemed when we were reading Rawls that the incentive, the reason he had for detaching distributive justice from moral desert was an egalitarian one. That if we set desert to one side, there's greater scope for the exercise of egalitarian considerations the veil of ignorance, the two principles, the difference principle, helping the least well off, redistribution and all that. But what's interesting is if you look at a range of thinkers we've been considering, there does seem to be a reason they want to detach justice from desert that goes well beyond any concern for equality. Libertarian rights-oriented theorists of the kind we've been studying, as well as egalitarian rights-oriented theorists, including Rawls, and for that matter, also including Kant, all agree, despite their disagreements over distributive justice and the welfare state and all of that, they all agree that justice is not a matter of rewarding or honoring virtue or, or moral desert. Now, why do they all think that? It can't just be for egalitarian reasons. Not all of them are egalitarians. This gets us to the big philosophical question we have to try to sort out. Somehow they think tying justice to moral merit or virtue is going to lead away from freedom from respect for persons as free beings. Well, in order to see 
what they consider to be at stake, and in order to assess their shared assumption, we need to turn to a thinker, to a philosopher, who disagrees with them, who explicitly ties justice to honor, honoring virtue and merit and moral desert. And that thinker is Aristotle. Now, in many ways, Aristotle's idea of justice is intuitively very powerful. In some ways, it's strange. I want to bring out both its power, its plausibility, and its strangeness so that we can see what's at stake in this whole debate about justice and whether it's tied to desert and virtue. So, what is Aristotle's answer to the question about justice? For Aristotle, justice is a matter of giving people what they deserve, giving people their due. It's a matter of figuring out the proper fit between persons with their virtues and their appropriate social roles. Well, what does this picture of justice look like? And how does it differ from the conception that seems to be shared among libertarian and egalitarian rights-oriented theorists alike? Justice means giving each person his or her due, giving people what they deserve. But what is a person's due? What are the relevant grounds of merit or desert? Aristotle says that depends on the sort of things being distributed. Justice involves two factors, things and the persons to whom the things are assigned. In general, we say, Aristotle writes, that persons who are equal should have equal things assigned to them. But here there arises a hard question. Equals in what respects? Aristotle says that depends on the sort of thing we're distributing. Suppose we're distributing flutes. What is the relevant merit or basis of dessert for flutes? Who should get the best ones? What's Aristotle's answer? Anyone? The best, the best flute players, right. Those who are best in the relevant sense, the best flute players. Is it just to discriminate in allocating flutes? Yes, all justice involves discrimination, Aristotle says. What matters is that the discrimination be according to the relevant excellence according to the virtue appropriate to having flutes. He says it would be unjust to discriminate on some other basis in giving out the flutes. Say wealth, just giving the best flutes to the people who can pay the highest price. Or nobility of birth, just giving flutes to aristocrats. Or physical beauty, giving the best flutes to the most handsome, or chance, having a lottery. Aristotle says birth and beauty may be greater goods than the ability to play the flute, and those who possess them may surpass the flute player more in these qualities than he surpasses them in his flute playing. But the fact remains that he is the person who ought to get the best flute. It's a strange idea this comparison, by the way, that, I mean, could you say, am I more handsome than she is a good lacrosse player? It's a strange kind of comparison. But putting that aside, Aristotle says, we're not looking for the best overall, whatever that might mean. We're looking for the best musician. Now, why? This is important to see why should the best flutes go to the best flute players? Well, why do you think? Anybody? Music. What? Best music. They'll produce the best music well, and everybody will enjoy it more. That's not Aristotle's answer. 
Aristotle is not a utilitarian. He's not just saying that way there will be better music and everyone will enjoy it, everyone will be better off. His answer is the best flutes should go to the best flute players because that's what flutes are for. To be played well. The purpose of flute playing, the purpose is to produce excellent music. And those who can best perfect that purpose ought properly to have the best ones. Now it may also be true as a welcome side effect that everyone will enjoy listening to that music. So that answer is true enough as far as it goes, but it's important to see that Aristotle's reason is not a utilitarian reason. It's a reason that looks, here's where you might think it's a little bit strange, it looks to the purpose, the point, the goal of flute playing. Another way of describing this, looking to the goal to determine what the just allocation, the Greek for goal or end was telos. So Aristotle says you have to consider the point, the end, the goal, the telos of the thing, in this case of flute playing, and that's how you define a just allocation, a just discrimination. So this idea of reasoning from the goal, from the telos, is called teleological reasoning, teleological moral reasoning. And that's Aristotle's way, reasoning from the goal, from the end. Now this may seem, as I said, a strange idea, that we're supposed to reason from the purpose, but it is, does have a certain intuitive plausibility. Consider the allocation, let's say, at Harvard of the best tennis courts or squash courts. How should they be allocated? Who should have priority in playing on the, on the best courts? Well, you might say those who can best afford them, set up a fee system, charge money for them. Aristotle would say no. You might say, well, Harvard big shots, the most influential people at Harvard, who would they be? The senior faculty should have priority in playing on the best tennis courts. No, Aristotle would re reject that. Some scientist may be a greater scientist than some Varsity tennis player is a tennis player, but still the tennis player is the one who should have priority for the best, playing on the best tennis court. There is a certain intuitive plausibility to this idea. Now, one of the things that makes it strange is that in Aristotle's world, in the ancient world, it wasn't only social practices that were governed, in Aristotle's view, by teleological reasoning and teleological explanation. All of nature was understood to be a meaningful order and what it meant to understand nature, to grasp nature, to find our place in nature was to inquire into and read out the purposes or the telos of nature. And with the advent of modern science, it's been difficult to think of the world that way, and so it makes it harder, perhaps, to think of justice in a teleological way. But there is a certain naturalness to thinking about even the natural world as teleologically ordered, as a purpose of whole. In fact, children have to be educated out of this way of looking at the world. I realized this when my Kids were very young and I was reading them a book, Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> and Winnie the Pooh gives you a great idea of how there is a certain natural, childlike way of looking at the world in a teleological way. You, rem you may remember a story of Winnie the Pooh walking in the forest one day. He came to a place in the forest and from the top of a tree there came a loud buzzing noise. 
Winnie the Pooh sat at the foot of the tree, put his head between his paws, and began to think. Here's what he said to himself. That buzzing noise means something. You don't get a buzzing noise like that, just buzzing and buzzing, without its meaning something. If there's a buzzing noise, somebody's making a buzzing noise. And the only reason for making a buzzing noise that I know of is because you're a bee. <laughs> then he thought for another long time and said, and the only reason for being a bee that I know of is making honey. And then he got up and he said, and the only reason for making honey is so I can eat it. So he began to climb the tree. This is an example of teleological reasoning. It isn't. It isn't so implausible after all. Now, we grew up and we're talked out of this way, of thinking about the world. But here's the question. Even if teleological explanations don't fit with modern science, even if we've outgrown them in understanding nature, isn't there something still intuitively and morally plausible, even powerful, about Aristotle's idea that the only way to think about justice is to reason from the purpose, the goal, the telos of the social practice, and isn't that precisely what we were doing when we were disagreeing about affirmative action? You could almost recast that disagreement as, as one about what the proper, appropriate purpose or end of a university education consists in. Reasoning from the purpose, or from the telos, or from the end, Aristotle says that's indispensable to thinking about justice. Is he right? Think about that question as you turn to Aristotle's politics. <laughs>